is blue. Blue is the invisible becoming visible. Blue has no dimensions. It exists outside the dimensions that are other colors. Eve's Klein. And I want to point out that the background on this whole PowerPoint is called Eve's Klein Blue, even though I'm not uh, delving into the art that he did. I stopped way before his time. So anyway, we're going to start with a painting that's found in the National Gallery of, in London. It's by Michelangelo. And this is an unfinished panel entitled The Entombment. It hangs in the National Gallery, and it was originally intended for a church in Rome called St. Augustino. And the painting, of course, depicts the body of Christ as it's carried from the cross to the sepulcher. The altar panel is finished except for one area in the lower right-hand corner, which appears to be a reserve for a kneeling figure. So right over here. Am I working this? There we go. So there's a figure missing. Other characters in the picture are complete, including that of Jesus, John the Evangelist, Mary Magdalene, Nicodemus, and Joseph of Arimathea. The blank space, presumably reserved for the Blessed Virgin, generates speculation as to why the artist did not complete the picture. What is the artist's original intention for the execution of this painting, and why did he abandon it so close to completion? Ecclesiastical tradition suggests that the Blessed Virgin would have been dressed in the deep purple blue robes that express her distinction as a mother of Christ. How does our understanding of physical science and history and economics and art help us solve the mystery of why Michelangelo was unable to fulfill the contract so, complete, so close to the completion of this work. The answer may lie in the unique challenges of incorporating the color blue into art before the 18th century. Despite the fact that humans were surrounded by blue skies and water, classical painters rarely use blue in their art. I do want to say when I'm referring to classical painters, I'm referring to the Greeks and the Romans. The Egyptians did have a blue. It was actually, they were the first people to manufacture a blue. And it was called Egyptian blue frith. And uh, it was made from copper silicate sand, and it was actually a glass that they ground. And uh, so there was a blue. Of course, in all of this classical art, when you have exposure to light elements, and of course, in, and in our day, pollution, there's always a problem with the colors fading. But what were the reasons why the Greeks and Romans seldom used blue? Was it their actual perception of color? Are their adherence to a classical balance? Are the lack of an extensive color vocabulary in their languages? The Greek philosophers Democrates and Aristotle perceived color as only shades of light and dark. And this leads us to believe that hues of different colors were just inconsequential to their culture. Blue fell into the dark range, whereas red and yellow were closer to light. Scholars often attribute the absence of blue in the Greek and Roman art to the, to the adherence to a four-color palette. The Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, in a treatise on color and the theory of painterly practices, states, the classic color palette consists of black, white, yellow, and red. And he suggests that most classical painters felt that the use of additional colors or the mixing of pigments was considered in poor taste. According to Pliny, the most revered Greek and Roman painters adhered to the four-color palette, and he praised their work for its purity and simplicity. Some historians feel classical artists associated the four-color palette with Aristotle's theory of the elemental composition of the universe, that of earth, air, fire, and water. Even Hippocrates in his medical school 
used a similar organization when describing human physiology. He stated that man was made of four humors, blood, which is red, phlegm, which is white, and yellow and black bile, which in a perfectly balanced mixture made up a perfectly balanced organism. Therefore, we could figure that the four colored palette in art maintains the same balance and harmony as the organization of the universe and its human constituents. Classical artists also did not mix the four colored palette, associating mixing with a, a diversion from classical balance. A Greek biographer and historian voiced his opinion of, these, of classical artists saying mixing produces conflict Conflict produces change and the putrefaction of whatever medium you're using. This aversion to mixing and the use of the limited palette imposed restrictions on the range of color in their art. Perhaps Greeks, Greeks' inability to produce new colors from mixing could be attributed to the lack of the primary color blue, which inadvertently could have been their justification for restricting the colors in their art and using the four color palette. Mixing the four color palette, if you took those four colors, yellow, black, red, and white, you would come up with tones of gray and brown. Even Aristotle, when he was discussing the rainbow, commented, no pigment mixture could generate green or violet. Without blue, artists could not produce green or violet. Debate over the authenticity of this four-color palette theory comes from scientific research that verifies that over 800 colors and variations could be derived from the four pigments that were used in the four-color palette. But the range of color was still limited to dark tones produced from mixing the red, black, yellow, and white. In addition to the restrictions of the four colored palette, classical art tended to be symbolic rather than representative, eliminating the need for an extensive palette that produces a range in color that we see in the natural world. Thus, Pliny's four color scheme was linked more to metaphysics than to any relation with hues found in nature. No Greek paintings remain today to verify the four color palette. But analysis, and, I, and this is an urn because we have no paintings uh, from Greece. So this is an urn with your yellow and your black and your red and your white. But paintings in Pompeii had color. And Pliny the Elder was from Pompeii. And in fact, he died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So anyway, uh, Philip Ball in his book Bright Earth states that tests show that no fewer than 29 pigments have been identified in the ruins in Pompeii. So Pliny, may ha uh, Pliny the Elder may have idealized his restrictive palette, but color frescoes, many containing blue, abound in the homes of wealthy citizens. So I guess the citizens did not adhere to the four colored palette. Blue, blue pigments available to uh, ancient artists include azurite, indigo, which is actually a dye, and in Egyptian blue frith. But the blue that was used, little has, but of the blue that was used, little has survived. Analysis of Egyptian blue frith indicates that the Romans did not possess the correct form of copper silicate sand to create a stable blue pigment as the Egyptians did. Scientific analysis has shown that many colors, especially the blues available in the classical period, tend to fade when exposed to alkali. And since they were fresco paintings, and frescoes are often painted directly on, uh, on plaster, this would subject them to a surface that was alkali. Scholars often argue that the color limitations that the Greeks and Romans had were merely a linguistic interpretation. Since language and culture define the acceptance of color, Greek literature describes a sea and sky without alluding to its blueness. Homer, to Homer, the Aegean Sea was a wine-dark sea. 
the Greek and Latin languages had no words to classify blue as a color. Linguists do identify words for particular dyes, minerals, or metals that compone, compose the colors, such as indico, or sapphires, or ultramarine, but no single word summarizes all the hues of blue as a distinct and separate color from dark tones. Some 19th century scholars have even gone so far as to suggest that the Greeks uh, were unable to perceive blue because they were blue blind. So uh, generally, but generally linguists believe the difference between blue and black was just inconsequential to both classical cultures, which is why they did not distinguish blue with a separate name. The Romans also associated blue with the barbarians that were threatening their borders. We've all seen Braveheart. The Celts and Germans dyed their bodies blue to terrorize their opponents. Therefore, to the Romans, the color blue evoked distrust, loose morals, and barbarians encroaching on their culture. Thus, we see from the Roman Empire to the Middle Ages, they were overshadowed, uh, blue was overshadowed by white, black, and red, which became the basic colors of social, political, and religious hierarchy. We could specialize, uh, speculate that these social, religious, and cultural preferences, along with perception and language, that these were a valid argument for the lack of blue. And also, we could say that the accessibility of a good blue was limited. Therefore, it was not utilized. But regardless, white, black, and red remain the colors that establish hierarchy until the High Middle Ages while blue remained the legacy of barbarians and peasants. Blue dye manufactured from a species of indigo that grew in Germany called wood became the color of clothing for the low estate. And I always think of blue jeans when I think of this. The Roman customs that showed a preference for white and red persisted into the 10th century Carolingian court where the color blue was banished. Now, I know I'm dressed in blue, and today is St. Patrick's Day. And someone said, well, you don't want to get pinched. Well, this happens to be a scarf that my dad bought for me in Ireland that was um, taken from the Book of Kells. Now, I don't know if the green in here was enhanced so that, um, You'd buy it because you were in Ireland and you expect things to be green. But you can see that the major colors are red, black, white, and yellow. So that persisted until uh, for most of the, uh, up until the high Middle Ages. Christianity then adopted the same color preferences for black, white, and red, expanding into the color green. White became the color of baptism, and Easter, the resurrection, and eternal life. And black was the color of Lent and Advent, and re represented abstinence, penitence, and suffering. Red represented the blood of Christ. It appeared at Pentecost and feast days of the martyrs of the church. In the 13th century, Pope Innocent III dictated a uniform use for liturgical colors throughout Christendom, using white, black, and red, and then adding the color green. Uh, in these days, we call the color green in the Catholic Church ordinary time, which I always think is sort of, you know, can they think of something better than just ordinary times? In the notes, he commented, this was Innocent III, that green was halfway between black, white, and red. So that's why he used that color. In the ninth century, dark shades of blue began to appear in liturgical manuscripts. Oh, I wanted to show you a picture here. Now, this was an Italian painting painted in 1736, but this was of the famous Greek artist Apelles. And you can see there he has his palette, and he is 
painting on the dull colors, the browns and the, the, the white and the blacks. And then over here, of course, the Italian artist is using the reds, the blues, or whatever. But that's how they represented him in his artist's studio. So Christian, um, in the ninth century, the dark shades of blue began to appear in liturgical manuscripts, and the heavy dark blue violets gradually evolved into brighter shades that represented the illumination of light. For the first time in Western art, they painted the cloak of the Blessed Mother blue. This signaled a change in the perception of colors but not without a lot of controversy. Violent debates about the role of color in the church persisted through most of the Middle Ages. For men of science, color was a phenomenon of light. For theologians and church intellectuals, color was not made of light, but matter, rendering it vile and useless. One side of the debate centered on the views of the Cistercian monks at Cluny, who believed color was merely a material substance that was both an immoral and dangerous obstacle in man's quest for God. On the other side of the controversy, Abbot Serge, a monk that oversaw the uh, construction of Saint Denis outside of Paris, gave color a place of beauty and splendor in the worship of God. And this is a stained glass from Saint Denis. I believe just the top part of it is original. Blue had a prominent role in spreading God's light through color and glass. Michael Pastoreau in his, blue, in his book, Blue, The History of Color states, blue was not only present throughout the church as the color of celestial and divine light, but it was also wedded to gold to evoke the splendor of creation. The union of blue and gold that was so prevalent in Western art and remains so today had its origin in the 12th century desire to evoke divine light and presence. So blue became the color of fashion in the 11th to the 14th century, starting with the robes of the Blessed Mother. When painters sought to display her virtue and status, they used the richest, most opulent colors. In art, color clothing and heraldry, blue gained status. There were two natural blue pigments available at that time, azurite and ultramarine, both rare and expensive. Displays of beauty and wealth became an important part of Holy Rome's dominion over its followers, and ultramarine and gold served to awe-inspire the faithful, creating a shift in artists' color choices thus generating a need for rare, intense blue pigments. Artists' demand for these bright pigments created the, emergence, the emerging industry rooted in ancient alchemy and medicine, which became the foundation for today's chemical industry. Companies such as Bayer and BASF have their origin in medieval dye and pigment manufacturing. Art and chemistry have a symbiotic relationship that has shaped the course of both fields. To study the chemistry of pigment, one must first answer the color, well, the question, what is color and how do we perceive it? Here is a blue from the 13th century, and it was ultramarine blue. Now, it's a deceptive picture because it looks like, oh wow, what a, a huge expanse of ultramarine until you see the actual source, which is a tiny book, okay? So here is also a chapel in Padua, and you can see that the ceiling is made out of ultramarine to mimic the sky. There's even little stars in here. Now, natural ultramarine has pyrite in it, which is fool's gold, but that, that would not be evident in the pigment because they process the iron pyrite out, the fool's gold out. And here is a miniature uh, with the use of various shades of blue. So, let's get back to what color is and how we perceive it. 
Isaac Newton developed our modern color theory by postulating the results of bending light with a prism. As he passed a narrow beam of white light through a prism, the colors of the rainbow appeared. From this discovery, Newton concluded that white light consists of all colors. Similar to a prism, as light strikes water droplets, it bends the light into different wavelengths. Now, pigments gain color from either absorbing or scattering white light. When a pigment absorbs light of a certain wavelength, our eyes no longer perceive color in that range on the spectrum. For example, you see my shirt, it's blue. The color in my shirt absorbs the red and the blue end of the spectrum, and so our eyes see blue. Detecting color requires, of course, some receptors in our eyes that receive the stimulus, transmitting it to the brain to interpret. The retina responds to colors in three different ways. Therefore, there are three different types of receptors or cones present in the eye, each sens sensitive to a different part of the visible spectrum. So there are other ways of generating color besides absorption. Scattering light, as we see in the rainbow, and I have a rainbow here that was taken by Dr. Novotny's husband and their recent trip to Africa. We see a rainbow with a scattering of light, and that is another way that we perceive color. Scattering of light is actually a physical property that has bearing on the size of the particles and thus the amount of surface area available to diffuse the light. This is in contrast with absorption, which depends on the chemical composition of the pigment. The size of the particle and the refractive index of the medium in which it is dispersed determine the amount of color generated by ground pigment. Some pigments like azurite, it's really intense blue when you, if you were to look at it in a museum or have a piece, but when you grind it, it loses its color. So some pigments such as azurite, which was an important color of blue in the Middle Ages, become lighter with smaller particle size because the greater the surface area, the greater the area to scatter the light. Pigments that scatter light appear opaque while those unable to diffuse light become translucent. Before chemists began to generate artificial pigments, in the early 19th century, the artist's palette came from natural elements. And most of those were in what we would call the D block, which is this lower blue block. It's ironic that it's nice ultramarine blue. Anyway, it, this, this block right here on the periodic table. So you see a lot of elements that generate familiar colors. For instance, if you look at the Statue of Liberty, you of course see copper, which is a blue-green, and nickel is a bright green. Iron, of course, we associate with a rust red. And um, other colors like, um, let me flip to the next one, but let me stay with the periodic table for a second. If you notice, it's not only these colors in the, period, in the center, chromium is another uh, one of the elements that, oddly enough, they substituted for lead, which uh, lead is very toxic, and substituting that uh, how, and cadmium helped with the toxicity of some of these metals. Most of these metals are considered toxic to humans. Uh, a lot of them down here, mercury, lead, uh, are considered heavy metals, which are bad for humans, of course. So anyway, um, the transition elements have characteristic bright colors, and we've seen iron and nickel and copper. And here are some solutions that I made of these three colors. Copper 2 nitrate, they're all the same concentration and all the same... Um, anion, although I have nickel 2 nitrate, I didn't have nickel 3 nitrate, but copper 3 nitrate, nickel 2 nitrate, iron 3 nitrate, all exhibit those characteristic colors that we associate with those. 
um, the close proximity of all of these elements on the periodic table suggests, as we teach in chemistry, that they have similar physical and chemical characteristics, which might contribute to their ability to produce color. Since color is generated when a substance absorbs white light at a specific wavelength, the absor absorbed light promotes the electrons into a higher energy level. This change in energy level produces the color. And it, sa it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. I always associate this with fireworks. When you boost the firework with a dynamite shell or whatever gunpowder that you use to boost it up into the sky, it's as if it's boosting into a higher energy level. As it falls back down to earth, it emits the characteristic colors that we are used to in uh, fireworks. In addition to the transition metals, we have lead, antimony, arsenic, and sulfur that also absorb light in a wide range of the visible spectrum. Metal compounds also form crystalline structures that allow them to combine their electrical field to uh, the electrical field of all the surrounding ions. This electrical field has bearing on the energy transfer of the metal ions. This is a, a lattice structure for sodium chloride. Unfortunately, um, the lattice structure that we use for ultramarine is not a in much demand, but of course sodium chloride is. So you can see that this is a crystalline lattice structure. If we took out the wires that hold it together, you'd have a better picture of what it looks like because all of these balls, which of course are the sodium ions and the green are the chloride ions, would be together in a nice little cube. But we, And if you looked at sodium chloride with a um, microscope or a hand lens, you would see that it's a perfect little cube. Um, but when we look at the lattice structure, the, not only the metal ion transmits color, but the other constituents do. And so let's look at two colors of blue. Notice this is copper 2 chloride, and this is copper 2 sulfate. One is the characteristic blue-green that you and I associate with copper, um, the Statue of Liberty is that color. The other copper 2 sulfate is much darker. Well, much like we find in ultramarine, it's the sulfur in the crystalline structure of the copper 2 sulfate that contributes to the darker color. Um, whereas the chloride ion does not absorb light in the same way as the sulfate ion does. In some metal compounds, there's a transfer of electrons that occurs from one metal ion to another or from the positive cation to the negative anion. This movement is known as charge transfer and it creates the deep blue of lapis lazuli. The color of ultramarine, which is made from lapis lazuli, comes from a polysulfide S3 ion unit encapsulated in what they call an aluminosilicate beta cage. So here's your aluminosilicate beta cage. This is a formula for ultramarine. Now, if you could take this structure of sodium chloride and you could remove the center such that you just have a little cage on the outside. And again, all of these ions would be close together. That's what you could visualize when you're talking about this beta cage that encapsulates the sulfur ion. And when I say S3, there's sulfur, sulfur, sulfur here. And those are the sulfurs that are encapsulated in that beta structure. And it can't get out. There's not a hole big enough. And it's that sulfur that contributes to the dark blue color. Transition between the outer orbitals of the polysulfide ion, which is this, produces an absorption band in the 600 nanometer yellow range, producing the dark blue overtones of ultramarine. The more sulfurs you have, the darker the blue. 
So the ultramarine that is found in Afghanistan is the richest, darkest blue, and it has the S3, the three sulfurs. Uh, other places where we find um, ultramarine, say in Chile, it has two sulfurs. So it becomes a lighter blue to even the green range. So the two primary blues were azurite, which scatters light for its pale blue color, and ultramarine, which makes the deep blue, which is generated by ion-ion transfer. While this atomic structure and all this information is uh, important, it's actually the geological composition and the difficulty of procuring and fabricating this material that gives it its value. Azurite and ultramarine were both rare and expensive. Despite the beauty and opulence of ultramarine, az azurite was actually used more than the ultramarine. There's several azurite mines in Europe, though the supply is limited. It's composed of a copper, and what it, we call it is a ligand, where you connect hydroxides and carbonates together. It's called a ligand. Azurite crystals appear dark blue, as blue as lapis, but when they're ground, just like if you were to ground, grind glass, they lose their color and fade. The size of the pigment gave the artist a range in color with fine grinds giving them a gray blue that they could use for a sky and the more coarse pigment producing the darker, richer color. Coarsely ground azurite became a problem because uh, it had to be secured with a glue mastic that had the tendency to discolor or it also had a tendency to chip. Also, azurite is a form of malachite, which we know is green, and in fact, they have the exact same chemical composition. Light, moisture, and pollution accelerate the change of blue to green in azurite. The late medieval craftsman Sanino Sanini, in his book on the preparation of pigment, stated, it's Azurite's beautiful to the eye, but it does not last. The most revered and costly of the medieval pigment was ultramarine, valued for its rich dark color and the stability of its pigment. Part of the cost was related to the difficulty of, ex of accessing and processing the lapis lazuli due to its remote origin. Lapis is found in one of the most inaccessible places on Earth. This is not a very good picture of lapis, um, and, and it doesn't look as rich as when they process it into the ultramarine, when you just look at the rock. Um, but it's found in the Himalayas. Marco Polo in 1271 stated, there are mountains in which there are found veins of lapis lazuli, the stone which yields the azure color of ultramarine is the finest in the world, but it's a very cold country. In addition to being difficult and in, to being inaccessible, it's very difficult to extract, hard to pulverize, and complicated to purify. Lapis lazuli is Latin for blue stone, and the word ultramarine translates to beyond the sea. This should indicate to you the great distance and difficulty of obtaining this precious pigment. For 6,000 years, lapis lazuli has been mined in an area uh, called Badistan, high in the Hindukush Mountains of northeastern Afghanistan. In this remote area, men scale treacherous mountains in a very narrow window of time to extract the lapis. In ancient times, they lit fires in the mines and then uh, threw ice water on the dense lapis, causing it to crack. Today, miners use dynamite and mortar fire, which, of course, is um, a sad a sad example of the political situation in the area. 
But they carried the, the broken pieces down uh, to a trading station located on the Silk Road where it was shipped to China, Persia, uh, India, um, Mesopotamia, and ultimately to Venice. And Venice served as a major importer and processor, uh, processing center for ultramarine. On a side note, just over the um, mountains from Badakstan is a uh, place where there once stood two giant Buddhas. One was 35 meters, the other 55 meters. And in the year 2000, um, the Taliban destroyed them with rockets. And I remember the, um, the Metropolitan and several other art foundations tried to save them. Well, uh, apparently, when you climbed up to the top of the Buddhas, there were ultramarine frescoes up there. So um, anyway, they destroyed both of them with rock of rocket fire. And uh, the reason they did that was to show the world that they would not have pagan icons in their country. It was the Persians who first developed a method of extracting lapis. It's a mixture of fool's gold and calcium carbonate, which is chalk, another word for chalk, silicates or sil uh, silicon dioxide, which is sand, and the blue lazurite, which is the main component of ultramarine. It's a very hard pigment, and it's difficult to grind, and it has a very, very complex method of extracting it. You have to, there was, uh, Sanino Sanini had lengthy instructions where he said you grind it into a powder, and then you make it into a paste with resin and gum mastic and wax, and you knead it in a cloth, and uh, over a period of weeks, months, you knead this daily. Then you set it in lye and squeeze and knead the dough-like pigment and lapis lazuli, the uh, ultramarine falls to the bottom. Uh, successive kneading and processing with a lye produced lighter and lighter pigments until it became what they called blue ash. Uh, Sanini praised ultramarine as an illustrious, beautiful color, the most perfect of all colors. One could not say anything about it or do anything about it that its quality would not surpass. So perhaps this was the pigment that Michelangelo was going to use in his painting. This painting is actually a little more than five by five feet. And even though the Italians were the importers, the main importers of uh, ultramarine, very few um, Northern European artists were able to afford ultramarine. But even though Italians did, um, it's, it's, this would be a very large area to cover in ultramarine. He could have used azurite, but then that would be the same color as, at this time, as Mary Magdalene's olive green robes, because as I said before, azurite turns green over time and exposure to water and um, other elements. So, from so in other words, it probably was meant to be ultramarine, and cost or the ability to appropriate the pigment what and prevented him from being able to finish the the, the painting. So therefore, from the Classical Greek period to the High Middle Ages, blue went from an unnamed color to the symbol of aesthetics and economic power. Michael Pastoreau, in his book on blue, the history of color, said blue became the color of the Virgin, the coat of arms for the King of France and King Arthur. Then a fashionable color commonly associated with joy, love, loyalty, peace, and comfort. So one cannot put a concrete answer on to why there was a sudden shift in color from black, from black, white, 
and red to blue. But Mr. Pastorini's judgment says it is clear that the rise of blue was not just a minor feature in Western history, but the expression of important changes in social order, systems of thought, and modes of perception. As I said before, Northern European uh, artists rarely used ultramarine because of the expense. In 1704, though, a blue was created by accident by a German um, manufacturer. He was actually trying to make red, mixing uh, alum, ferrous sulfate, and uh, then precipitating it with alkali. And he ran out of alkali. And he went to his boss for replacement. Unfortunately, the boss had contaminated alkali which had animal blood in it and as Dr. Novotny can teach us that has hemoglobin which of course has iron in it and when he mixed it and heated it up it produced a dark deep blue which we call Prussian blue. And then in the early 1800s a French manufacturing society gave a 600 franc prize to a chemist that could synth synthesize artificial ultramarine. A French named Jean-Baptiste Jean Guimet produced synthetic ultramarine for one one-hundredth of the cost. This blue was used extensively by the Impressionist paintings. It's not as vivid as natural ultramarine because the particles of synthetic pigment are uniform in size, therefore they diffuse light more uniformly. But it was a blue that could be afforded. Ultramarine, though, was the most durable paint. It was not toxic. It didn't bleed like indigo. It didn't turn azurite. It was very stable. And it was very good in frescoes because it didn't turn color in water. I have a few paintings using ultramarine. This is a painting by Titian, and he was one of the first people that mixed uh, ultramarine with uh, oil. And ultramarine really didn't work well with oil. They mixed it with lead white paint. And in mixing, they got all shades of blue. So in other words, we saw the church in Padua with the dark blue sky. Now they could make a light sky or a stormy sky. Uh, and uh, he was a master at mixing the, the blues with that lead white. Here is another um, painting using the lighter blue, an Italian painting. And here is Vermeer, who was a master. He not only mixed ultramarine, in this painting here, he has dots, actually, of yellow, ultramarine, and azurite. So combined together, he was a master at mixing the colors and giving the contrast. So on a couple of side notes, um, ultramarine is also found in Chile and Zambia on the other side of the Himalayas uh, from Afghanistan and also in British Columbia. In our own Museum of Fine Arts, we have four paintings with ultramarine, one very, very small. And uh, there is a Chinese painting. And um, there is also a painting from native Indi Indians in British Columbia with just a strip of ultramarine blue. Uh, another kind of amusing note that I found, um, Prussian blue used to be a color in the paint box of the uh, Crayola Crayon Company. Uh, but in the 1950s, which most of you are too young to remember the late 1950s, um, they did away with Prussian blue and called it midnight blue because they felt that young children could not relate to the word Prussian blue. But ultramarine is still one of the colors in the 72 box of Crayola crayons. Um, so therefore, 
To chemist, color is a clue to composition, and if measured carefully, it reveals the molecular structure. And chemists, you think, well, science and art, do they mix? But I recently went to a seminar that was put on by the Museum of Fine Arts that was about lapis lazuli. It was a day-long seminar, and four of the six speakers happened to be chemists. One a well, one was a geologist and three were the chemists. In fact, on the staff at the Museum of Fine Arts, this person is both Museum of Fine Arts and the Menil, they have a resident chemist. And the problem with using chemistry is you've got to evaluate the art without destroying the art. And there's a great deal of effort going into ways of of evaluating the pigments and whether we should clean it, uh, what the resin or whatever they coated the painting with, uh, it, without damaging the painting. And so uh, there's a lot of work going on to do that because so oftentimes we are surprised, as we were with the Sistine Chapel, when they cleaned it. In fact, some people just didn't care for it. And the bright, bright colors, the same thing happened with this picture by Titian. People walk in there and say, how gaudy. But, you know, analysis of the pigment says that they were indeed those colors, and he liked bright colors. So this has been an adventure for me. Um, it has been um, a way for me to use my science of course, the art was difficult for me because I am not as comfortable with the, the verbiage that goes with art, but I like the way this topic merges both, both subjects. The first time I heard about this topic, there was um, a woman who is uh, an analytical chemist that also teaches at a liberal arts college and she has a course in uh, chemistry for art majors. And she talked about um, identifying different artists and different pigments in ancient uh, manuscripts in Armenia and how the evaluation of the pigments and the location or origin of that pigment distinguish between different artists. For instance, the ultramarine was used in the first page by the premier artist. Other schools use the azurite and other uh, lesser pigments of ultramarine. But I became fascinated with the color blue, and then when, when um, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Novotny said, why don't you do blue? And I found that there was a lot of of important information about the color blue in art and chemistry. Any questions?